Welcome here in the auditorium, Prattville Church of Christ, and also to those who are watching online, streaming live right now, and then uh, anybody who might be watching later. Glad that you're here with us. Um, so I'd like you to read along with me or listen closely as I read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 this morning. This is a longer reading than I've done any of the last two weeks, the previous two weeks. So I'm going to give you a moment to get ready. Take a breath. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And I'm reading from my old trusty New International Version, somewhat trusty New International Version. Your version may vary a little bit in wording, and I think that's good. It's going to keep you alert as you try to keep up. Not that you need any encouragement, really, to be alert when you look at the Word of God, because, as I've said before, this is the very best thing that you'll hear me say today, certainly during our 45 minutes together. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those who were tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see for themselves what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. God blesses attention to his word. Change is hard. When some character trait or belief is a part of you and has been a part of you all your life, or at least for many years... It can be very difficult to change that character trait or that belief by yourself. A shortcut to change could be what some might call a significant emotional event. Now this could be positive, but most of the time we think of significant emotional events as negative. A trial or a challenge or a crisis that causes a fundamental break with what I think about myself or the people around me or my environment or my past, my present, or my future. And when change is needed, the longer I wait, the more likely a significant emotional event will cause hardship. In this miraculous event, this healing event, in the ministry of Jesus that we just reviewed here in Mark 5, Jesus was met by a man possessed by demons. Not just a demon, not just a few demons but thousands of demons. This man was truly in a hopeless situation, and he had nowhere to turn but Jesus. And Jesus turned his hopelessness to hopefulness with a powerful and compassionate miracle that we're going to slice and dice this morning as we study together. In my opinion, the healing of the demon-possessed man in the Gerasenes is the most graphic and intense of the scriptural accounts of when Jesus drove out demons. And I happen to agree with Brother Layton, who makes that observation in his book. 
Now, other accounts hit me more emotionally. Uh, this isn't a very emotional reading to me, where, for example, the, uh, the one where the, the demon possessed the boy and then threw him into the fire to burn him up or threw him into the water to drown him. Like, that makes me, like, I, that hits me uh, in an emotional spot that this one does. This is a, a, a grown man here. This boy is a child, and that, that makes me feel different. But this one, this description, particularly in Mark's um, description, this one really puts the reader, puts us among the gravestones. It makes the reader, makes us, hear the demonic wailing in the still of the night. It makes the reader see the blood-stained and broken chains. You will find this account in Matthew and Luke, as well as here in Mark, and that's consistent with the events that I talked about last week and the week before that. And if you happen to be comparing the accounts, as you read Matthew's account, you'll see that Matthew includes a second demon-possessed man, two fellas out here among the tombs. Now, this is not a contradiction of terms between this, this account and the other accounts. Both Mark and Luke focus on the one who came back to Jesus later. And I think this is kind of like how the Bible focused on the one out of ten lepers who came back to thank Jesus later. Or maybe the woman with the issue of blood who returned to Jesus at his command and confessed that she was the one in the crowd who'd been helped and healed. For whatever reason, Scripture doesn't say anything else about the other nine healed lepers. And Scripture doesn't say anything else about the other demon-possessed man who was here in the land of the Gerasenes. Mark and Luke focus just on the one who came back to Jesus after the healing. So, healing from what? Demon possession. There are many ideas about what that means around the brotherhood and the world in general. What is this demon possession? How did it happen then? Could it happen today? This class is not about that. If you're interested in learning more about that, then I can highly recommend searching the Scriptures. You will not find a a wrong word or an incorrect word about it in the Scriptures. If you want to go beyond what the Scriptures say, see what others have to say about it, I personally like the 1994 book by Joe Beam called Seeing the Unseen. Um, that's Joe Beam is the fellow's name. Seeing the Unseen is the book. It is not specifically about demons or demon possession. But what it really did, for me anyway, is it helped me recognize the weapons that the enemy uses to attack us and those we love. Now, in the context of the lesson this week, we can know, because Scripture says it, this particular fellow was, in fact, possessed by demons. And we know that he had no hope for relief around here. And that's based on the language used in Scripture. You could guess that there's somewhere between 2,000 to 6,000 demons possessing this fellow. Now, I'm not an expert in demon possession. I think I've already disclosed that. And And so I can't tell you the number of demons that you yourself could have possessing you and you'd still be okay and in your right mind. But I'm willing to bet, this is just a guess here, But the number of demons that you could safely have possessing you and be okay would be zero. That's just my opinion. I think one is probably way too many. And this fella had so many more than just one. He had legion. And what we see in this passage from Mark's gospel is how Jesus brought this demon-possessed man from hopelessness to a spark of hope to a sense of hope to seeing hope. The hope that he's seen, and that is fullness of hope or hopefulness. We'll also see how Jesus is Lord over the spiritual and the physical. He has, and he had like then, he has still today, dominion over both. This particular interaction with demons, which is one of at least seven that's recorded in the Old and New Testaments, might be the most intriguing example of the journey from hopelessness to hopefulness. In context, Mark is recording Jesus' travels, and just before this account in Mark 5, Jesus is crossing the Sea of Galilee. He'd been teaching about the kingdom of God over on the other side, telling everyone how citizens in God's kingdom must behave, and kind of on the side, he was healing sick people too. 
as Jesus and as many disciples would fit, got into a boat. They sailed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And as they were on the sea, a storm hits. And everyone panics. Except Jesus, who was sleeping through it. They woke Jesus up, asking him if he cared. Do you even care, Lord? In response, Jesus commanded the storm to be still. And that amazed them with his power because the storm obeyed. The wind stopped. The seas were immediately calm. He took the opportunity then, after that happened, to teach a short lesson about faith. Now, although this is not recorded in Scripture, in any account that I've seen, my hope is that they let him nap for the rest of the route. And so, well-rested, our well-rested Lord now is arriving at the opposite shore. And no sooner, when they get to this place, this is the region of the Gerasenes, no sooner had Jesus disembarked when he got accosted by the least popular guy in the region. Now, we are introduced to him first as a guy who was possessed by demons. And then Mark tells us, goes on to describe that this fellow lived among the tombs. He lived in a graveyard. Then we learn the guy had superhuman strength, enough to break chains and leg irons. And then Mark tells us this fellow wandered around the graveyard screaming all the time, day and night, and would even cut himself with the sharp rocks that he could find there among the hills. Now think about this. Could this be any more isolated? Could this fellow have been isolated any more than he was? The folks in town, right, we know that the folks in town couldn't subdue him, but we also know that the folks in town were trying to chain him up inside this graveyard. And I think they were doing that to let nature take its course. They didn't want him around anymore. And they themselves couldn't subdue him. So maybe they figured, well, if they chain him up, you know, and, and they could keep him from getting around and scavenging for food, I guess. Ugh. Maybe they could keep him from getting something to drink and he could die first. Maybe if he wasn't able to move around, maybe the dogs would come and eat him. I, I don't know, something, anything to get rid of this fella. And whatever right mind this guy could have had left would have been cowering in the very deepest corner of his mind, completely helpless and imprisoned. It is hard to imagine anyone being more helpless and alone. So here's a quick summary of some bullet points from the three accounts about this fellow. He was overwhelmingly possessed by demons. He lived outside of town in the tombs. He was naked. He was fierce. He was completely uncontrollable. And he continuously cried out and cut himself with stones. As this pitiful... But powerful man gets close to Jesus. Remember, Jesus had just gotten out of the boat. Hopefully well rested. He'd just gotten out of the boat. And here comes this fellow right at him. Right away, first thing. As he gets a little closer to Jesus, one of the demons, or maybe more than one, caused the man to rush forward and to shout some very interesting things. In Mark's account, the demons recognize Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. That's interesting. Then they say, in God's name, meaning that they're reminding Jesus of the authority of God. And as we'll see in their request, they're reminding Jesus of God's mercy. Then they beg Jesus not to torture them. Then Jesus asks for a name, and the response is recorded in the, the NIV as, My name is Legion, for we are many, just as I'd read. Now during Jesus' time, Legion was a specific term describing the most powerful Roman military formation of soldiers. Um, the Roman Empire used different numbers of soldiers in this formation. And that'd be depending on what part of the empire they were in. Were they way up north? Or were they over east? Were they west? Were they heading down south? So different sizes in different regions. <clears throat> they used different numbers of soldiers depending on the threat that they were going to face. Was this um, an internal threat, maybe an uprising? Or was it they were going off to war somewhere? Uh, was it for internal security around Rome? So he used different numbers of soldiers for that formation. And then also, the Roman Empire lasted for a long time. And so at different times during the empire, the legion was different sized. 
But the best research gives a range of 3,000 to 6,000 Roman soldiers in a legion. And that's why I think Brother Layton joins the most reliable scholars in numbering demons in the thousands. This group, this legion, numbered in the thousands. Now, another piece of circumstantial evidence, I think, for thousands is what happens next. This demon horde that's possessing the man begs Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Perhaps in desperation, the demons ask Jesus to send them into a herd of 2,000 pigs on a nearby hillside. All right, so here's the circumstantial evidence. It's not really evidence, just circumstantial. Have any of y'all ever heard the question, usually asked snarkily, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? I've heard that. Some of y'all may have heard that. Okay, Um, I don't have an answer to that. You're not going to get that answer from me today. But Scripture does tell me how many demons can infest a herd of 2,000 pigs. And the answer to that is a legion of them. And so I don't know if it was one demon per pig or whatever, but I'm just, it's circumstantial evidence that there may be thousands of demons going into thousands of pigs. And then what happens to these pigs? As soon as the demons go down into the pigs or into the pigs, probably up because they're on a the hillside, uh, these pigs stampede down the hill into a steep bank and then they go into the water and there they drown. Now, as you might expect, this was quite a surprise and shock to the people who were out there with those pigs taking care of them. And what they did, Scripture tells us, is that they ran to the town and through the countryside telling what had happened. As their story spread, the people from the area, the town and the countryside, came out to where Jesus was. And then what they saw... Well, we'll see their reaction in a minute. <clears throat> but, but what they saw was this fella, who all of them knew about, but he was sitting by Jesus. He was in his right mind. He was calm and quiet. He was fully clothed. This man that they had isolated, that they had chained up, that they had left for dead, maybe even had aggressively hoped to cause his death, either directly or proximally, and there he was in his right mind by Jesus. So, of course, they rejoiced, right? Hmm. Maybe you'd think they would, but the Bible doesn't tell us that's what they did. Instead of rejoicing that the demons were gone, instead of rejoicing that the man was cured, instead of even selfishly rejoicing that they'd have peaceful nights, they wouldn't have to hear that screaming all night long, the locals were afraid. And they, in turn, begged Jesus to get back in the boat and leave the region. It's interesting to me, too, that Jesus doesn't appear to resist the villagers. In verse 18, right after the locals ask him to leave in verse 17, the Bible says, as Jesus was getting into the boat. Now, we don't have any idea exactly how much time elapsed between these two verses, 17 and 18. But Scripture doesn't record an argument. Jesus went. And and verse 17... There's a period there in the NIV. I don't know if there's period in the original Greek. Is there? Did they use punctuation? Or was it just a... All right, so you... Are you holding your Greek open right now? Is there a period there at the end of verse 17? Okay. Okay. So may or may not be a period there. But in the NIV, and probably in every English language translation, there's a period there. Between the period where they ask him to go and the very next word... As he went, I don't see an an argument recorded, and I don't see a long period of time where Jesus is considering whether or not he's going to leave the region. They ask him to go, and he goes. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, uh, if, if the Lord's willing, and we get through this, and talk a little about the Lord leaving when he's asked to go. But let's come back to this man, this fellow who had been demon-possessed, and look at the contrast between the bullet points that we had about what he looked like before, and here's some bullet points about what he looks like now. He's in control of his mind, no longer a madman. He's sitting quietly with Jesus, not roaming around the graveyard. He's dressed, not naked, except maybe for scraps of chains that were still on. And he's sitting there 
with Jesus' disciples, not trembling like the demons were in the presence of Jesus. <clears throat> so as Jesus is letting the locals escort him to the state line, as it were, this cured man asks Jesus if he can come along. Jesus instead tells the man to go home to his family and friends, and, and the, the folks in town, and then tell them what happened. Tell them the story of how he received mercy. So the man does what Jesus said, and then more. Not only does he go into this town, but he goes into the entire region of the Decapolis. This is a region of ten important cities and lots of smaller villages in what's modern-day Israel and parts of, like, part of Israel, part of Syria, part of Jordan, kind of right in that part of the world, around the Sea of Galilee. But pretty good-sized area. And throughout this whole area, this healed man tells everyone what Jesus had done for him. And apparently, he's a pretty good storyteller because the result is that everyone is amazed. They're filled with wonder at what had happened to this man. And as Mark concludes this part of the gospel, uh, verse 20 or so, right in there, this man has made the journey from being completely hopeless to being hopeful. This former madman has now become a committed missionary for Jesus. So, as with all events in the life of Jesus, there's a lot for us to learn. And here are some key lessons that Brother Layton presents to us. And I've got some emendations as well that, that we'll think of together. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things this lesson encourages us to do is to look at our own lives. Has Jesus changed my life? So it's easy to see the before and after difference in the man who's possessed by demons. And today, it might be easy to see the difference in a brother or sister who came to Jesus from or as a result of a prison ministry. Maybe easy to see. Or maybe someone has come from a motorcycle gang. Might be easy to see the change. Or, or maybe from a life of prostitution. Or maybe someone who's come to the Lord out of addiction. But when I look at my life as someone who was in church from my infancy, every time the doors were open, the differences are going to be harder to see on the outside. But the thing is, and, it, and I'd also like to suggest maybe there are more people who grew up going to church like I did around here than motorcycle gang members. And there may be some, I don't know. But I'm guessing there's probably more folks like me in a Sunday morning auditorium Bible class. Maybe the external differences aren't as clear. But the thing is, the internal differences between those folks where the outside differences are easy to see and the outside differences are harder to see, the inside differences are the same. They're the same. Before I touched this fellow who went to church every time the doors were open as an infant all the way till today, the difference inside matters. Before I touched the blood of Jesus in baptism, I was lost in my sin. I was dead, even as a young teenager. I was a tool of Satan, and it didn't matter that I was in church every time the doors were open. Once I understood that I was Jesus' enemy, I had to start living my life as a servant of Jesus. And this is the story of every Christian. No one is accepted from that. All of us were enemies of Christ. All of us opposed Christ. All of us were madmen living out of control. And Jesus, when we encountered him, when we contacted his blood and were saved, we became new and different. So, are you sitting with the disciples of Jesus like this healed man was? I'd say probably you could say yes to that. Here we are together. Are you telling people wherever you go what Jesus did for you? just like this healed man did? Whether I was forgiven of a lot of sins, or even just one sin, even that one sin earned me the death penalty, and Jesus saved me from it. And that's a story worth telling. So you say, well, maybe, maybe I don't know enough to tell the story. Maybe I don't have the right education to tell the story. Maybe I'm not gifted in public speaking so I can tell the story. We don't know hardly anything about the, this man, this fella, this uh, Gerasene demoniac. I've been wanting to work that 
a little phrase in. A little tough, a little tough. Gerasene demoniac. <clears throat> we don't know hardly anything about this fella except the Bible tells us he was from the region of the Gerasenes. That's about all we know. Maybe he was a great teacher of the law of Moses. Revered far and wide and had fallen on hard times and ended up being over here. I kind of doubt it. I kind of doubt it. I don't know. Scripture doesn't say. But here's what I think. I think he's probably just some regular Joe. Just some lunch pail kind of a guy who fell, on, uh, he, he fell into maybe a bad crowd or he got wrapped up into something bad and, and he just kept going, either maybe out of ignorance or purposefully. But for sure, he was ignorant of how to get out of it. He had no way that he knew to get out of it. And then he just kept going until he was so far gone that thousands of demons were in possession of him. But when Jesus healed him, he knew that he did not have to be a Bible scholar to do what Jesus said to do. He didn't have to be a gifted public speaker. He didn't have to be able to enunciate all his words clearly. The fellow, all he needed to do is to do what Jesus said to do. Jesus said to tell people what Jesus did for him. And Jesus tells us to do the same thing. And, the, of course, the more we know, the more we can tell. Um, like what Jesus had done for others, for example. Like what I'm doing here. You know, I learned about this story, and I can tell you all about what Jesus did for others. But if, even if I didn't know this, I'd still know what Jesus did for me, and I could tell you about that. If people ask questions, well, they've already heard the gospel, the good news about what Jesus did for me. And I know this may be a crutch for me, but the parable of the sower, you know about sowing the seed? The parable of the sower doesn't give me an example of what to do if the soil asks me questions. It just says, so, so. Now, listen, I would love to be able to answer the questions, and there's a way for, for me to answer questions, and there's a way to be better at evangelism. And Brent teaches classes on evangelism every now and again. Others might as well. And I'll bet you a nickel. Now, I'm not a gambling man, but if I had a nickel in my pocket that I could put out there, I'd bet you that if you asked Brent for the syllabus of an evangelism class, he would give you a copy of that syllabus so that you could get a head start for the next time he's going to teach or someone else is going to teach an evangelism class. And I'll bet he's not the only one. In a congregation like this, I'll bet there are plenty of folks who know things about evangelism and would be happy to help you get a head start if that's what you want to do. But none of that is an excuse. None of it is an excuse to not tell people what Jesus did for you. So another thing that we can learn from this miracle is that nothing in the human sphere of power can free us from Satan's influence. Only Jesus has the power to do so. And when we turn to him, he grants us the relief that we so desperately need. And this doesn't just happen one time and then we're done with Jesus. Hey, Jesus, thanks for washing away my sin. I'll see you in heaven. And between then and now, you know, if I see you, I see you. It's not at all like that with Jesus. Even mature Christians can slip up. Maybe something comes back from the former life. Like we've got that brother or sister from a motorcycle gang. Maybe an old friend from that motorcycle gang member's past comes back into town and he's got a pocket of pharmaceuticals to share. Maybe. Or maybe it's something new that's come into your life. Not something from your past, but something new. Maybe a severe illness or the unexpected or unfair death of a loved one. It'll bring new questions about does God really love? Does God really care? Is God really just? These things can come upon us even though we're mature Christians. And yes, we're saved. But yes, we still need Jesus every hour. Just like the song we sing says. Another thing that we can learn from this healing and this calming of the storm that was right before it is that Jesus is Lord of the unseen world of spirits. Jesus is Lord of the heavens above, and Jesus is Lord of the earth below. The spiritual and the physical realms respond with great alacrity to his absolute authority. This response to his authority is both immediate and complete. He heals the sick. He calms the storm. He drives out the demons. 
Now, we have sicknesses in our lives. Sometimes these are literal physical sicknesses. Sometimes they're emotional sicknesses. Sometimes they're spiritual sickness. Jesus heals the sick. We have storms in our lives too. Sometimes these are literal storms like the tornadoes that seem to track through our region all too often. Sometimes we face figurative storms of trials that burst upon our heads and we cry out like in the song, Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. And Jesus calms the storm. We have demons to deal with as well. Now, I am not sure, as I've said before, how literal demons work in this era. This era when the gifts of the Holy Spirit that remain are the non-miraculous ones. But Scripture teaches us that just as angels have things to do on earth until Jesus comes again, demons are busy on earth until Jesus comes again. Again, I don't know exactly what that means, and I encourage you, if you want to know, study your Bible or find people who are experts at it. Test them all against what the Word says, of course. But it's easy enough for me to think of figurative demons that people face. Now, I don't know that anybody here is old enough to remember the time of, um, uh, was it the, the Prohibition, right? Prohibition era. It was demon liquor. You'd see it on the, on the signs that folks hold up. Demon liquor. Um, And so that phrase may not be familiar to you. Um, I don't know that it's used very often anymore, but I'll tell you, if anybody who suffers from that addiction of alcoholism or anybody who loves an alcoholic would be really comfortable with the phrase demon liquor. But it's not just that, of course. There are many other things, fear, guilt, anger, So many other things that can take control of people's lives. Maybe even the lives of those of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus drives out demons. Now some will ask if demons can possess people today. And I don't want to go into this in much detail, but here's what I'll say about it. Satan is not omnipotent, all-powerful. He's not omnipresent, he isn't everywhere all the time. And he's not omniscient, he doesn't know everything. Satan can influence us, but he doesn't influence us against our will. You can find that in James chapter 1, James chapter 4. If we allow his influence to grow, in that way he takes over parts of our life until it seems like he has control. But we can always turn to Jesus and get right. Just like this demon-possessed man. No matter how far away Jesus may seem to be to me, he's always just one step away. And no matter how far I've run, no matter how far I think I've distanced myself from his presence, as soon as I turn, he's close enough to touch. But, But please realize, when we ask Jesus to leave, He leaves. The locals from the Gerasenes are a terrifying example of that. When they responded in fear and asked him to leave, he got back in the boat and headed across the sea. Jesus doesn't force his will on us. He offers us choices. And he mercifully and patiently and lovingly waits for us to choose him. And he rejoices when we choose him. And when we repent, he restores us. So let's take a few moments here, close to the end, to think about this demon-possessed man's journey through hope sparked to hope sensed and hope seen. To me, hope sparked is interesting in this case study because it isn't directly addressed like it is in the other two. But I'm going to go off script a little, brother. I'm going to go off script a little and and tell you what I infer from the story. And this is just my interpretation. I'm going to assume the demon-possessed man usually moved towards people who went near his area, whether it was the graveyard or the hills nearby. If, If he saw someone coming close, he would normally just go towards them. 
his approach to the boat as it got close to shore then would be a normal thing, just a normal, his normal behavior. But something changed when the demons discovered that the man from the boat was none other than the Messiah. Their hope was sparked, I'll say, but in a negative way. They knew they could only hope for punishment, and yet they still begged for mercy. Each of us has experienced this. All we could hope for, lost in our sin, was punishment. Now, when we came to Jesus seeking mercy on His terms, He forgave us. When the demons asked for mercy on their terms, He gave them the mercy they asked for. And they got sent into the nearby herd of pigs. And I can't even speculate on what's the deal with the pigs and the drowning and why they would have named that. But for the sake of this story, I believe that even demons see a measure of hope sparked in Christ. Not for them, but for us. For sure, though, hope was sparked for the man who was possessed. Once the demons were cast out, the man's consciousness and self-awareness emerge after having been imprisoned by those demons. As the narrative continues, the man is now sitting and talking calmly with Jesus. Perhaps this is the hoped sensed part of the story. What they were talking about isn't recorded for us, but the man ends up asking to come along with the followers, but instead obeys the command to go and tell others. And to me, this is good evidence that his cure moved him from gratitude to a deeper commitment to serve by telling others. And it's that deeper commitment to serve Jesus by telling others that's a good indicator of hope seen. As Jesus leaves, he gives the man a mission requiring an active faith. And the man obeys and even goes beyond. He travels throughout the region of the Decapolis, including parts of Israel, Syria, maybe even some Jordan. And he's not traveling to sell encyclopedias or vacuum cleaners. He is telling his family and friends plus everyone in the surrounding uh, cities what Jesus did for him. So, as this class ends, I've got a minute and a half or so. Think about the two reactions to the healing of the demon-possessed man. The man who was possessed rejoiced and quickly became obedient to Jesus' commands. The other reaction is seen in those who were taking care of the pigs and the townsfolk and locals from the countryside. They reacted in fear and begged Jesus to go away from their region. We have to give an answer for ourselves what our reaction will be in the presence of Jesus. We'll re, uh, rejoice and welcome Jesus in to cleanse us of what's not pleasing to God and then go and tell what Jesus has done for us in obedience to Jesus' commands? Or will we tell Jesus to depart from some region of our lifestyle or some region of our behavior or some region of our personality? Will we tell Jesus that we aren't ready for him to be Lord over every region or every part of our lives? Or maybe we'll tell Jesus, thanks for the cleansing, but I'm going to keep it to myself. I don't appreciate what you did enough to obey your command and tell others. Or maybe I'm afraid that if others know that I'm not perfect, I'll lose my standing among my family and friends. This is not what Jesus wants for us. So as we grow in our journey from hope sparked to hope sense, to hope seen, we'll become more like the man in today's Bible story, eager to follow Jesus and eager to tell others what Jesus has done for us. And as we study about hope, I hope that you'll join us again next week.